Shalom and welcome to a special edition of TV7 Jerusalem Studio, this time from Tel Aviv, where we will discuss the Islamic Republic of Iran and its nuclear ambitions, as well as the international scrutiny directed at it. To do so with us here is the former Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Mr. Oli Heinonen. Mr. Heinonen, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me, and it's a pleasure to be in Tel Aviv. Mr. Heinonen, in 2003, you were the Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, during which you also held within your responsibility the Iran file. The Islamic Republic, as we know today, in 2003 had an active nuclear program with the ambition of acquiring nuclear weapons. How were they capable to maneuver under the, the nose of the international community, and to what degree do we know today that they're not in the same process? Yes, the, as you said, in early 2003, Iran was found in non-compliance with its safeguards undertaking under the safeguards agreement, which they had to conclude under the NPT. Mm -hmm. And they were running fairly large uranium enrichment program, working with the various compounds of nuclear materials without meeting their reporting obligations, and they were caught. And that point of time also were uh, raised questions that whether they have some nuclear weapons aspirations because some of the activities which they were doing were somewhat unusual for a country which was just going for peaceful use of nuclear energy. So in October 2003, they concluded an agreement between EU3 to suspend their nuclear program so that the IAEA can complete its verification activities related to the past history of the program to make sure that everything was under the peaceful use. And one of the conditions of that agreement was the statement by, by Iran that it will provide a full, complete disclosure of its past, past nuclear program to the IAEA, which then will be verified. And unfortunately, we know today that that uh, promise was not very fully executed by Iran. Indeed, this was unveiled, of course, after the State of Israel managed to uh, what uh, some may call a daring operation, and that I think is an understatement, to get into Tehran to find uh, Iran's nuclear archive, or at least part of that, and retrieve that for uh, the purpose of unveiling it to the international community something that you also had the opportunity to go through those documents and uh, what did you realize after reading those documents? First of all, you know, we knew that they had these nuclear weapons aspirations already in 2003 and particularly during 2005 it came obvious from some other information which the IAEA got. But now that I have been able to see this enormous amount of documentation, 50,000 pages, hundreds of DVDs, we see that Iran was having much more ambitious plans than what we thought. And I think that this information also indicates that the intelligence agencies all over the world didn't have that deep knowledge on the Iranian aspiration as we could, uh, or what we thought, or what they uh, pretended. And just as an example, the plan was by 2004 this was stopped in 2003, 2004, to have four, manufacture four nuclear weapons based on high enriched uranium, and then have built a site to demonstrate by nuclear test, underground test, that this uh, nuclear device works. So this is not any more kind of theoretical study or feasibility study as they, the IAEA concluded in 2015. So in 2015, as you uh, mentioned, the International Atomic Energy Agency concluded that the Iranians were not uh, necessarily aspiring to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, there was a lot of, of details pertaining to what Iran can and cannot do. Uh, the question, though, is why would the Iranians necessarily approach uh, the international community in willingness to uh, bring about a some kind of agreement, uh, even though, of course, we know that the sanctions regime at the time was quite crippling Iran's economy and it was desperate to reach some kind of agreement. But in those circumstances, was that agreement actually something the international community could be satisfied with 
to assure that Iran was indeed um, curbed from acquiring such dangerous weapons? I think that the people thought that when they conclude this agreement, they have that verification regime. And if we uh, recall, for example, the statements by Secretary Kerry, he said that they will block all routes for Iran to achieve a nuclear weapon capability. But this deal, I think, that was also based on the hope that once this is concluded and the implementation start, sanctions get lifted, Iran will change its attitude and aspirations and develops its nuclear program to peaceful direction. Now when we look at the documentation, we see that it was perhaps not thoroughly thought because the agreement and the verification system focuses, yes, correctly to the production of fissile material at the declared facilities. When it comes to the undeclared locations, which Iran has some history, the provisions are not as strong as people say. But, then comes the but. Nuclear weapon is a system. We can describe it like a tent with the three poles. One pole is the production of fissile material. Second pole is the manufacturing and development of the nuclear device itself and the delivery vehicle for that. And then the missile itself. So in order to block someone to achieve a nuclear weapons capability, you need to deal with all those th three. Otherwise, your eggs are in one basket. And even in this case, that basket where it is has a leak in bottom because its strength is not really to detect the undeclared activities. So we're, I'd like to focus on one of those uh, three uh, poles that you were talking about, uh, the pole of the ballistic missile. Uh, the ballistic missile has been uh, one of the biggest concerns of uh, the E3 as well as the United States uh, pertaining to Iran. And Iran consistently denied any um, acceptance of deviating from its ballistic missile program, even though uh, within the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action it calls upon Iran not to undertake any activities pertaining to ballistic missiles that have... Uh, or ballistic missile technology for that matter, that have the capacity to carry a nuclear payload, um, which is, as you say, something that should have been thwarted from the root. Why is Iran still adamant to pursue that? And why did the E3 specifically, especially France that was the biggest hawk during the uh, negotiations with Iran, allow Iran to continue with this program? Well, we have to look at ballistic missiles, maybe also outside of the nuclear application. If we look at Iran from their point of view, I'm talking like an Iranian now, a uh, country needs some defense. Uh, missiles is one way to defend, and we need to keep that in mind that the Iranian uh, air force is very old, very weak, so they need something else. The question is the capability of those missiles. It's to go with the payload and it's to go with the distance. And one of the weaknesses on this uh, JCPOA is the definition because it says uh, ballistic missiles designed to be capable of right. is the first thing. And the second thing is that there's no monitoring regime. So you see missiles flying, but how you can establish that is this missile good for uh, nuclear devices or not? And then there needs to be also common sense in this picture. Because all these missiles which uh, Iran has actually are of old Soviet or Russian origin. In the Soviet Union they were used to deliver nuclear devices, practically all of those which we see. So for me, all these missiles, as you correctly say, are capable and in reality designed to carry nuclear devices. And then there's one additional flaw on that, that, you know, this agreement was negotiated a few years ago. It should have also included cruise missiles, because in particular in recent years, Iran has been able to field cruise missile which flies up to 2,000 kilometers, which means that can uh, reach Tel Aviv. And its payload could be good enough to carry a nuclear device, and it will be very difficult to defend against this kind of missile. So we need to look this missile uh, 
issue you know, from the very different angle, as you said. So the Iranians are still very adamant of not uh, following through on the matter of the ballistic missile program. We could hear the supreme uh, leader of the Iranian regime, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, saying very specifically that the ballistic missiles will always remain part of uh, the Iranian defensive capabilities, even though uh, defensive uh, as they may be, they have already been used, including a medium-range uh, cruise missile, as you mentioned, um, that was fired towards Israel, of course, unsuccessfully penetrating Israeli airspace, but that's a different story. The question here is, how do the E3, in particular, when we're talking about the E3, of course, we're talking about France, Britain, and Germany, uh, for the sake of our viewers, how could they not understand the concerns, uh, even though they keep saying that they're concerned about it? They're not following through on those concerns by implementing safeguards that will limit Iran's breach of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Now we need to talk about two things. First of all, the ballistic missiles. There's no monitoring regime. So, you know, we cannot say much about the breach. This was the, this was the weakness. Mm -hmm. And then we have to think, you know, when they concluded the agreement. When you conclude this kind of agreement, which you know that there are deficiencies of laws, it's act actually a risk assessment. And I think that their risk assessment was pretty much based on this hope that Iran will change its behavior over the time. Now we have seen that it's not the case when we see these missiles flying, we see this technology trans transferred to Yemen and God knows where. Then comes the uh, nuclear part of the uh, program, which is also a problem because as, as we talked in the beginning, uh, Iran maintained this uh, nuclear archives, which is fairly detailed design of nuclear weapons. They were building facilities which were supposed to produce nuclear weapon components, assemble them together. Are those facilities still there? What are those capabilities? And why would you keep such kind of documentation there in the warehouse if you don't plan to use it at a later date? Because this goes to the heart of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Article 2 of the treaty says that uh, countries should not seek to acquire nuclear weapons. That's what these documents and this work of the Ahmad plan was, acquiring nuclear weapons. And then there is a, even a, a, in the preamble of the JCPOA, there is a repetition of the legal uh, commitment which Iran had already done once and, and actually violated, is repeated there. So we really need to now to go to the substance of the matter and see where they are, where are the uh, missile program, where is the nuclear program, why did they keep these documents? And then think carefully. These documents are from year 2003. It gives a snapshot of the Iranian nuclear weapons program in 2003. What has happened during those 14 subsequent years? Where are they today? Are those activities still there? If they are, which are the activities? Who is doing there? Have they done progress or not? Or have they just erased everything and there is nothing left? These are the questions which need to be raised now and then look, you know, how to deal with the fight. Based on your assessment and uh, following this uh, topic for many years, how long is the Islamic Republic of Iran away from being able to create a nuclear warhead for that matter and uh, an actual bomb uh, for that matter? That is a difficult question to give a precise answer. The easy part is perhaps to estimate how, how quickly they can produce fissile material for one nuclear weapon. Enough high-end uranium in, uh, uh, in their centrifuges. Those centrifuges which are currently installed there, this equation is very simple. It will take about one year for them if they operate those centrifuges, which we know where they are, one year to achieve that goal have enough fissile material for one nuclear weapon. If they double the capacity, so instead of 5,000 centrifuges, they operate uh, 10,000. They have at least 15, 20,000 of them, so if there are enough in stock. Then it will be only half a year, because this is directly proportional to the number of centrifuges. Then the question is how quickly they can put them up. But then comes 
maybe a bit more difficult part of the question, they have also more advanced centrifuges, which are four, some four or five times more powerful, some ten times more powerful. So if you have those ten times more powerful centrifuges, so then thousand centrifuges equals ten thousand old ones. So you can put very quickly those one thousand up. And that's why, you know, in reality, the true breakout time, which the politicians normally don't tell to us, is much shorter because one can put those new centrifuges. Then comes the other part of the question, how quickly you can make a nuclear weapon from that high end uranium which you produced. The far easy part is actually to turn it to nuclear weapon component, uranium metal, machine it, shape it. Normally, if everything is set up, you don't need a very complicated uh, laboratories for that. I have a thumb ruler, two weeks, maybe at most a month. So now you have pieces of uh, which you put inside your nuclear weapon. But then is the question of the rest. And this is where we have the biggest uncertainties, because we don't know how good is the nuclear weapon design. Now we will see from these archives quite a lot of it. It will be now studied. We will see how far they are, which are the possible flaws, have they solved everything. And then is the question of the delivery vehicle. We have not seen them doing kind of telemetric tests where you bring the missile up and then bring the re-entry vehicle down where the nuclear weapon is because nuclear weapon doesn't explode when it hits the ground. It explodes somewhere half a kilometer high. So we have not seen those type of tests and we don't know how good they are. But then on the other hand, when I looked at this co come from the old Soviet Union, so I could well imagine that that part has been solved. Mm -hmm. So altogether, I think it's important now to go to those archives, use them as a vehicle and also look the uh, missile development part. And then one can do a, a better estimate, but I would not give more maybe half a year or maximum one year on top of that what what is when it has been when nuclear material is available depending a little bit on what else they have been doing and this is a crucial point now for the international community because this is still time to stop the nuclear weapons aspirations of Iran if we let this one to slip through I think we are going to have a long-term problem do you believe that the decision by the Trump administration to withdraw from the nuclear agreement, which, uh, as you stated, was relatively flawed uh, when it comes to being able to monitor the Islamic Republic's activities and actually monitor also the components within those activities uh, with regard to the ballistic missiles, for instance, being able to verify their compliance. Uh, if that's not possible, did the Americans make the right decision to pull away from this deal? and? Uh, was it not more significant for the Americans to target the Islamic Republic's Revolutionary Guards Corps, for instance, which is responsible specifically for the ballistic missile uh, activities? Well, well, we can look at it from various angles. First of thing, let's not forget UN Security Council Resolution 2231 is in force. There are obligations for Iran, there are obligations on the missiles, there are obligations on the behavior uh, and export of technology, there are, there are obligations under the JCPOA and IAEA safeguards. Those provisions are there and they should be implemented regardless whether the US is in or out. Now, then we also know that these flaws which the US and the others acknowledge are in JCPOA, actually during that winter of 2017 to 2018, US tried hard to pursue Iran and the others to amend or modify the JCPOA to have better provisions, but unfortunately those didn't go through. And then they made a political decision that for them it is better to leave and then impose those sanctions and hope that with this sanction regime like in 20. 10 to 2013, uh, Iran's willingness to negotiate a new agreement improves. Well, time will show whether this works or not. Some assessments uh, believe that 
the Iranians and the Americans are already in negotiations when we're talking about the rhetoric, uh, this rhetoric that goes back and forth. It's part of the initial foundation of those negotiations between the two sides. Do you believe that the Iranians would ultimately come uh, to the negotiating table and reevaluate uh, uh, their position towards uh, the international community? And uh, to what degree do you believe that the Europeans will give uh, the, the backing to the American administration in order to establish a unified front, which we all know how important it is uh, when we're talking about tackling one regime or another that is aspiring to pursue malign activities? I think that Europeans have said in public that they are not overly happy with the provisions of JCPOA and they want to improve those. And the question is really which way you now select. You take this harder way where you push Iran to comply through the sanctions or you do it in a, some softer way, try to per, pursue them to do. Uh, I think that Iran doesn't actually with the longer term have here very many possibilities. I think that they have to come to the negotiating table. And the question is now under which conditions. Maybe they look in the beginning from the purely from political angle. First of all, you don't want to surrender after all these hard, hardships. Then there might be uh, not perhaps administration change in the U.S., but let's, they may want to see the election, which is a little bit more than one year away in the U.S., the next presidential selection. Well, what kind of administration will be there? Will it be something similar? as the previous one, which could be more with whom they may have easier time to negotiate. I think that would be a mistake because I, I think I see a lot of Democrats also want actually somewhat different uh, agreement. Then Iran has also then other things like their own presidential election coming a year later. So it's a very complex from that point of view. Then I think it's not possible also for Iran to leave the agreement because then they lose also their supporters. I don't think that uh, Russia will accept it or China or maybe some of the heavyweights from the non-aligned movements. So the deadline that the Iranians stated of six months and they will uh, move out with all kind of limitations already being taking effect, uh, that's just uh, raising the stakes in front of the international community? Yeah, that's it. Is. Uh, and they did this in 2005. You remember when the Paris Agreement started to collapse? In Paris Agreement, they agreed to suspension of uranium enrichment. They were unhappy with the outcome of the agreement. They, did, they felt that they didn't get the, what was promised. So then they started gradually to increase the enrichment. And now we see it in the latest IAEA report. They installed this new, more powerful centrifuges. But they don't change the picture as such. But it's a kind of indication that Iran shows that, look, if we put more of those centrifuges, if we have more of those, the breakout time uh, comes down. And then they set another deadline or threshold there on the 8th of July, that if uh, certain things are in place, then we let our uranium inventories grow. And when they grow, the breakout time comes down. And then same is with the heavy water. So let's see now when we come to this July 8th, what's the response of the international community, how they are going to deal with that, and what will be the next step of Iran. They most likely, one option is that they increase the rate of enrichment. Now it's still growing the enriched uranium inventory fairly slowly. They can increase it by installing additional centrifuges, as I mentioned or improve the rates, uh, or if they want to be a bit more provocative, they go to the higher enrichment. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the statements recently, and uh, like a spiritual leader, so he said that we can actually do practically any enrichment we want. Mm -hmm. They have d up to now done, done up to the 20% enriched uranium 235, which already shortens the breakout time. But they may m demonstrate to start to go, for example, just as an experimental basis for, for uh, high-end uranium. That will send a very different 
message. I hope they don't do it, but you know, that's probably also in their cards. So they will do, will do a very calculated next move, and we will see it in a less than a month's time. Since the agreement was adopted in 2015, uh, specifically referring to the uh, 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 JCPOA and uh, its ratification or uh, the legal grounds to it through Resolution 2231, the Iranians seemed to establish all kind of components that would allow it to break out to a nuclear weapon a lot faster, as you uh, just mentioned, including its ballistic uh, missile program, which it's been very much uh, active in uh, developing the Shihab 2 and 3 and, and developing all kind of elements to it during that period of time since 2015, as well as you mentioned the high-grade uh, um, enrichment capacity through the new Fordow plant that uh, was unveiled just uh, several uh, years ago and uh, provided the Iranians, again, a lot more capacity to break out a lot faster. Why are the Europeans still reluctant to recognize Iran's aspirations when we're talking about providing them the tools or within still remaining in compliance, but providing them to tools to break out to a more uh, significant position with regard to a nuclear weapon? Well, they still have the hope that they can contain the program. Instead of, at this point of time, they have decided not to, by any way, to try to eliminate it, but keep it as it is, contain it, and as I said, hope that the Iran with these other incentives, economics, etc., will change the mind. And I think that uh, I don't see any incentive from the Iranian perspective to change the mind because uh, this JCPOA actually gives them an opportunity to improve their enrichment capacity over the time. After year 15, there is no limit other than that Iran says that we will continue to produce fuel for. Uh, light water reactors, but there is no number limit for the enrichment capacity. And if you uh, go back and listen to the statements of a spiritual leader, they will uh, have 220,000 uh, SWU enrichment capacity, which is, if we take this old fashioned uh, centrifuges, which they have now 5,000, it means 220,000 such centrifuges or more advanced ones, so the capacity. Because and, and then you have to look, what will be the breakout time that time? Weeks maximum, mm -hmm. if they want. And then it will be much more easy also to conceal, because when you have this huge fleet of centrifuges, and as you will find on those memos which we wrote from my institute, so you can hide a kind of parallel military program behind a civilian program, and it, you share some of the infrastructure and then you have those secret facilities like Fordo underground or certain mm -hmm. facilities in Parchin which are part of this cache Iran, Israel picked up. And those will be very, very difficult to find. And a good example, just let's put Iran aside. Look how long it took for the intelligence community to find that nuclear reactor construction in Syria it was all one year or a little bit more away from the start when it was finally found out. So uranium enrichment, if you look enrichment only, is actually easier to conceal than a nuclear reactor. Well, we're drawing near to the end of our interview and I'd like to ask you, you mentioned July 8th, um, what are your predictions, analysis for the near future? Will this uh, deteriorate into an all-out conflagration, as some may uh, uh, allude to, or will uh, the negotiating uh, protocols uh, uh, resume in uh, trying to resolve this issue? I think we will still see some escalation based on my past, past experience. I have not seen much of the willing, willingness of e either side to give up at this stage. So Iran most likely will increase its capabilities. And now they are then parties looking who blinks first. I don't think it's in the interest of uh, Iran to go to a crash course or try to 
leave the JCPOA, but they may uh, stop uh, some of the verification activities and at the same time increase it. So we are heading, uh, I would say, to somewhat long, hot summer. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much, uh, Oli Heinonen, for being here. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.